The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. You could have read the book already or written it yourself. You're a good interviewer. You got good. <laughs> <laughs> you got good comments more so than most. When you talk about emerging adulthood, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, in most periods of history, the majority of people were dead by then. <laughs> so, so I think they've miscalculated. I would do this for free. I hope my pastor's not hearing me, but this it's, it's, what, it's what we do, but it's what we're called to do. Both socialism and communism have been explicitly condemned by popes. Starting with Leo the Thirteenth in the nineteenth century. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKeg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, we ask through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment through might hear your voice and obey your command. Well, friends, not long ago, there was a worldwide synod on youth taking place in Rome. And it's, I think it's time for us to reflect on the fact that uh, a lot of the youth have not only voted with their feet, a lot of them haven't entered the church at all. Uh, among young people, the, the, large, the most uh, rapidly growing religious demographic is none of the above. Here to talk to us about that is our returning guest, senior editor of First Things, Matthew Schmitz. Welcome back to The Catholic Current. Thank you for having me back, Father. Matthew, back in March, you wrote an article for um, First Things called What Young Catholics Want, and you started off with a really surprising and disturbing description of a photoshopped uh, photograph of a, a young priest with some young people. Can you tell us about that and what your, your thoughts are on that? <laughs> sure. Well, this was uh, for a fundraising newsletter sent out, or kind of pamphlet sent out by a few uh, dioceses in France. Um, and, and there was an image of a young priest with a couple of young people, uh, you know, just kind of the face of young French Catholicism, different races, uh, you know, men and women. And the young priest was wearing a cassock, which is pretty common among young priests in France, you know, just as you would see that on a lot of, say, young American priests in Rome today, even if they're not necessarily right. wearing it here back in the States. Uh, but a couple of these French dioceses uh, uh, photoshopped out the uh, buttons on on the priest's cassock, and they photoshopped in blue jeans to make him look uh, kind of more hip and with it. So uh, I I just had to comment on that because um, you know that's a kind of uh, almost an you could say an older person's idea of what young people are like. Well, they must you know they must wear blue jeans. They must like rock and roll. But this is a young priest who wears a cassock, and maybe he prefers Palestrina to Bob Dylan and the Beatles. Uh oh. Uh, well, you know, I, I think back to. I mean, th this is this is not a new phenomenon. Although I think it, it's it's gained momentum over the years. When when I was a new priest, uh, I was told at at a university, "Don't be too Catholic. You'll only drive the students away." And then five years later, that wasn't the case, and the powers that be were at pains as to how I was both Catholic and drawing people into the church. And I said, it's not me. It's authentic Catholicism, which makes me wonder why you've been so reticent about authentic Catholicism all this time. Uh, and here I am now, a few thousand miles away uh, from that place. In your article, you referred to this doctored picture, and you said it's a symbol of what young Catholics are and of what older Catholics don't want them to be. And you went on to say, with a little manipulation, the authorities produced an image of youth acceptable to, to the old. I, I know th uh, I'm asking for, for speculation here, but it's something that, that I've seen before. When we talk about attracting young people, uh, people my age and older assure me that what we need to do is, is get get bigger uh, bigger amplifiers and more guitars and a drum set and maybe a light show. And whatever we do, we should only speak English and not Latin and not have incense. Uh, wh what's driving that? <laughs> right, well, I mean, there's one, one of these uh, concepts you, you encounter is kind of outreach, right? And there's a, there's a sense that in order to outreach, we have to kind of go outside ourselves and we have to 
uh, kind of be different than what we are than what we have been. So I was at uh, Mass on Sunday, and uh, they were making an announcement about a young adult gathering that will be happening this weekend at, at the parish I was at. And they said, you know, first we were going to have um, a kind of separate Mass for young people that's going to take place kind of in the uh, church basement, uh, you know, in a more intimate setting, and then we'll go out to a to a bar afterward. Um, you know, and you can kind of talk to the father there, and uh, have no problem with, of course, <laughs> with fathers you know going out to the bar and been been happy to share a drink with uh, with priests. Um, but I I just felt it embodied this idea that uh, you know we we the proper sphere of, of of reaching these people is not by inviting them into the church, but by somehow going out of the church. And right. I think that people people do want to be, in, if, we're, if we're going to welcome people, if we're going to invite them, and we have to invite them into something. There has to be a church building there, <laughs> there, and it, it ought to look like it ought to look like a church. Right. Um, you know, especially in, in this moment, I think one of the reasons that these general these generational dynamics are so strong, so that you you could. Look at a bit, you know a few a few generations of American Catholics or Catholics across the world. There was a generation that came before that, that came of age before Vatican II, so mm-hmm. they were young, say in, in in the 50s or the early 60s. But their religious formation was effectively, um, you know, what Michael Novak would have called a fortress Catholicism, right. the kind of you know, Catholicism of you know here are the parish schools, here's the Baltimore Catechism. And a lot the, of people the notorious felt that was quite Catholic con- ghetto, right? And you yes. know, many people felt that was confining. And um, though though I didn't live it, I, I'm sure that it was. And then you have the generation that came of age uh, during Vatican II, and I would say that that um, generation that came of age during Vatican II, and in its, in its immediate wake, the people who were who were raised by the kind of fortress Catholics, mm-hmm. you know, they they had an experience of the church as a very Real uh, kind of active presence too, uh, you know. For that, for them, the institution mattered. So there are a lot of, you know, there there are many Catholics um, in the baby boom generation who maybe don't believe everything uh, the church teaches, or or necessarily even very much of it. Um, mm-hmm. But they will go to mass, uh, right. say at least once a month, and mm-hmm. they they do support their parishes. And uh, when they die, they'll probably give bequests to their parishes. Right. You know, what you see among uh, millennial Catholics, of which I'm one, is that the people who aren't really all in whole hog, mm-hmm. they're they're not they're not in at all. So you don't have that uh, kind of attachment to the institution among people who don't have in a really strong and vivid way the faith. So mm-hmm. there's a stronger polarization among young Catholics between. Uh, the people who are in and the people who are out, and that's that's one of the things creating this dynamic where you know young Catholics say, "Well, we want liturgy, we want tradition," and you know one reason that that's be- becoming a kind of recurring demand of young Catholics is that those other people who maybe would have wanted something a little different, they're they're checked out completely now. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I'm reminded of, of the old saying that uh, the trouble with generals is that they're always fighting the last war. And maybe those who grew up in uh, the heady days of uh, immediately af- after Vatican II, maybe they did grow up in an environment that, that was uh, stifling and smothering, etc., and they needed to be liberated from that. But I, I certainly don't think it's the case now that people are are overwhelmed by the presence uh, of, of a ubiquitous uh, cultural Catholicism. I don't think there's anything they needed to be liberated from right now, except for the, you know, the clutches of, of the world, the flesh, and, and, and the devil. Uh, do, do you think that the older generation who's insisting on more guitars and more banners is going to draw young people in? Do, do you think they're, they're fighting ghosts from the past? Uh, I'm, absolutely. I mean, I uh, have you know, been lucky enough to kind of be in a world where they're I've encountered a lot of uh, very kind of good, solid Orthodox priests, you know, good liturgies, and you know, people who maybe don't like those things would say, well, you know, very conservative, very traditional, very regressive. But in all that time, trying to, you know, when I've knocked around this world where there are, you know, uh, you know, priests, parishes who are who are relatively uh, 
sympathetic to what you know Novak would have called that fortress Catholicism. And you know, going to confession, um, you know, just kind of during anonymous confession hours or whatnot. I don't think I've ever received a, a severe penance or mm-hmm. a stern talking to. I have sometimes had priests say, "Well, are you sure that's a sin?" When I'm, <laughs> I'm not being. I know I'm not being scrupulous. I remember one time confessing that I had uh, got drunk, um, mm-hmm. which one really ought not to do. Right. And <laughs> and so I I confessed that, and he said, "Well, are you know, are you sure that's a sin?" I thought, well, <laughs> I didn't argue with him, but I thought, you know, I kind of think it is. So, um, it's uh, you know, I haven't encountered that kind of. You know, there's that image of the very harsh, judgmental church. You know, the kind of priest wagging his finger, and uh, uh, un, you know, men make mistakes of all kinds. And sure, no, no doubt there are people who have run into those cases, and I'm not trying to deny it. But I, w- I would say that I don't believe it's as common as uh, laxity, as um, a kind of nonchalance uh, or harmful indifference. Right. You know, it's like the recent admonitions about not turning the confessional into a torture chamber or stop preaching in such a way that indicates our obsession regarding abortion, homosexuality, and contraception. I don't know what prompted that person to say those things because that hasn't been my experience, the experience of most people that I know. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Matthew Schmidt, senior editor of First Things, and we're going to talk about uh, the recently concluded Synod on Youth and get Matthew's take on that. You don't want to miss this interesting conversation with a, a thoughtful and intelligent man who is deep in the faith. Stay with us. We'll be right back. If God is calling you to give in support of the Station of the Cross, we want to do our best to make sure we receive your donations. Please let us know if recent changes have been made to your payment information so that we can better serve you as you continue to bless us with your financial support. Update your information today at thestationofthecross.com or by calling 1-877-888-6279, extension 104. This Divine Mercy Reflection is from the Diary of St. Maria Faustina. Scripture tells us to live one day at a time, each day having sufficient trials of its own. In paragraph 1655, St. Faustina echoes this same sentiment. O Christ, if my soul had known all at once what it was going to suffer during its lifetime, it would have died of terror at the very sight. It would have not touched its lips to the cup of bitterness. But as it has been given to drink a drop at a time, it has emptied the cup to the very bottom. O Christ, if you yourself did not support the soul, how much could it do of itself? We must live one day at a time and drink from the cup of God's will one drop at a time. In this way, we will endure and overcome life's trials and live fully in the will and peace of God. This Divine Mercy Reflection is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. I am wonderfully made, for you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. I am an entirely new, unique, and unrepeatable action. Human life is sacred. Think about it. Coalitionforlife.com Thank you for listening to The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Each morning, The Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. 
Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKig of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our question today is, what do Catholic youth want? Our guest is Matthew Schmidt, Senior Editor of First Things Magazine. We began our conversation at the top of the hour with the radical suggestion that what Catholic youth might want may actually be tradition. And we speculated as to why that might have upset an older generation. In this segment, we're going to take a look at the recently concluded Synod on, on Youth. Matthew, what, what are your initial uh, impressions uh, on the, the conclusion of the Synod? Well, I'd say that we, we saw the most... Um controversy and heat over the inclusion of a single term uh, in the Synod documents, uh, and that's the term LGBT. Um, mm-hmm. You might say, well, what's it matter uh, if we include that acronym or not? And I, I think you could just say it was a, it was a largely uh, symbolic fight about how open the Church should be to, uh, to new sexual identities, say to the sexual revolution generally, mm-hmm. and uh, ultimately to kind of, uh, you know, the kind of, you call it the bourgeois, bohemian lifestyle of, of the West. So you would have, you know, African bishops or bishops from uh, poor nations, poor European nations like Poland and Hungary opposing that initiative, um, right. and then bishops from, uh, from, the, from the richer countries being the main ones uh, pushing it. So I think, you know, we, we saw <sighs> that. And how much does that have to do with young people? I, I don't know, but that was one of the main uh, battle lines uh, in the Synod. Well, I, I know that there were some youth representatives, I believe, from Pakistan, and t- told the Synod Fathers, if you include that phrase in the final document, you're going to have to give us Vatican passports and let us stay here, because uh, our Muslim neighbors will burn down our churches and our homes. Uh, so it, it's a fair question as to... Um, who is who is set in the agenda and and whose voices were were being that's, listened to? That's extraordinary. I, I hadn't heard that. Um, it does remind right. me of something. Uh, uh, some Catholics told me when I was in Nigeria uh, last year. Um, in Nigeria and in some uh, parishes, they will um, administer uh, communion in the hand, which is of mm-hmm. course very common here in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, but in most parishes, it's still administered only on the tongue. And uh, I spoke to one man who had been mini- a priest who had been ministering in the north of Nigeria, where there are a lot of Muslims, and he he told me that uh, when they tried to introduce communion in the hand, the Muslims uh, were mocking the Catholics, saying, uh, "You can't really believe that's God if it's uh, if you put it in your hand." Um, and uh, you know, one one doesn't have to follow that derisive logic. It's not right. people who receive communion in the hands still do believe it's God, of course. But uh, you, it's always worth remembering that uh, it's not only uh, it's not only secular liberalism that Christianity is contending with. So I, I think back, Father, to um, an, an earlier synod on the family at which uh, Cardinal Robert uh, Sara delivered an address, and he talked about the two apocalyptic beasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's it, an image taken from the Book of Revelation, and uh, you know when when one apocalyptic beast appears, the people will be tempted to to go f- both to flee it and worship the other apocalyptic beast. So it's the way hmm. that one threat can drive you into the arms of another. And he right. said the two apocalyptic beasts are secular liberalism on the one hand, and a kind of uh, fundamentalism, uh, especially an Islamic fundamentalism on the other hand, that mm-hmm. uh, you know will. You know, kind of d- destroy destroy Christianity from this uh, kind of uh, this very narrow um, and hateful uh, perspective. That's not that's not all of Islam, but it's a uh, it's you know the the very violent form of it that's uh, now active. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so mm-hmm. I think we should heed keep keep that in mind. You know, these so the, these Pakistani Christians are facing the other side of the apocalyptic beast. We have to you know, we have to have solidarity with them. And you know, I, I think those those difficult, painful facts don't fit into uh, the, the rather congenial narrative that we can, if we just put coexist bumper stickers on our car, we'll, we'll all we'll all get along. And you know, 
when people harumph about uh, young folks who are asking for tradition, uh, one might be tempted to ask rather sardonically, well, well, gosh, you know, why is it young people seem to be rejecting the new Pentecost and the new springtime we've been enjoying for the past 50 years? And then people look at me with some measure of, of confusion. Uh, so I'm, I'm just dubious about... Uh, about people who claim to know better than what the church has always done and what the church has always taught for uh, for reaching y- young people. I've been looking at your Twitter feed this morning, uh, Matthew, and, and you have some references to the goings-on uh, in France. There's a, a lot of social unrest these days, and you, you mentioned... Uh, in, in some of your your news observations, that uh, that the unrest, the social unrest, is not only driven by by the young, but by those who are identifying a, as Catholic. And uh, it's been the case for several years now that the uh, majority of ordinations in France are with traditionalist communities like the Fraternity of Saint Peter and the Institute of Christ the King. And and it puzzles me because you know France has prided itself on being anti-clerical and uh, and non-religious for at least 100 years, 150 years. Do you have a sense of what's taking place am- among the, the youth in, in France and, and what's driving them now? My sense is that they, uh, they, they don't like a, what they would view as an American uh, kind of conservative uh, capitalism that's all about uh, you know, free markets um, and uh, free speech. They have a kind of more uh, traditional... Kind of, it, it's not it's not pro uh, communist or pro left wing, but they they are kind of attracted to this European conservative model where there's a big focus on ecology, um, mm-hmm. a big focus on social conservatism, and that's bound up with their with their notion of uh, tradition. Um, you know, I, you see this in the kind of arist- it's a more it's a more aristocratic um, kind of you know classical uh, Catholic form of politics, and I do think you see that uh, coming back a little bit after what was maybe an age of really extraordinary um, influence, not not just for America as a nation, but for more uh, kind of liberal and Anglo-Saxon ideas. And it now seems that we're some of these more continental visions of um, an organic people with the different uh, orders as a uh, maybe coming back in France and across Europe. And I think that would be tied to this sense of retrieving Catholic tradition. Could you say a little bit more about what you mean by social conservatism in this context? Sure. Well, in France, they had the, uh, a huge, a huge uh, millions of people uh, participating in this march in Paris uh, called Manif Portus, um, protesting the introduction of gay marriage. And what was so different about the gay marriage debate in France and here in the U.S. was, A, in, in France there was a mass movement. There was never a mass movement in America against gay marriage. It never happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a mass movement against abortion. A lot of people didn't favor gay marriage, but they mm-hmm. never uh, they never went to the streets. Mm-hmm. They never assembled and made themselves physically present. And in France that happened. And along with this uh, distinct uh, physical manifestation, there was a different uh, ideological kind of nature to the protest. They focused uh, much more than American opponents of gay marriage did on the idea that children, each child has a right to a mother and a father. Hmm. And so it was more about uh, the notion of inheritance, the obligations between generations than it was in America. Here in America, we had a mo- somewhat more abstract debate about what is the nature of marriage so our main mm-hmm. focus a little bit more on the partners and less on the children. You see that too in France. Um, there's a much stronger opposition to surrogacy, mm-hmm. whereas in America, even among, say, very you know the ch- the church uh, opposes surrogacy not because they uh, the church has any. I mean, the church does, hopes and prays that everyone will be able to enjoy the blessing of children who uh, is in a position for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the church opposes the creation of uh, these embryos that are that are then almost always destroyed in the process of uh, right. in the right. surrogacy process. And you, what you see is that here in America, even among people who oppose abortion or are relatively conservative, uh, they do go through surrogacy, and they they don't have a problem with it instinctively. Whereas in Europe, there's a, a very strong instinctive opposition to that. So the social conservatism has to do with some 
what would almost seem to be more deeply held or visceral ideas of uh, family and the responsibility mm-hmm. of parents toward their children mm-hmm. than maybe we have. Um, and uh, and that's, that's combined then with this uh, notion of ecology. And then, of course, uh, in France, there's this... Uh, you know, it's it's very very different from America because they have a a large and completely unintegrated, or largely unintegrated population of Muslims. And uh, right. in America, you know, we have immigrants, but as a rule, they are from uh, countries that are uh, Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not not to say everyone is a uh, you know in America right, or. Right, but- I, I, I think Central the Americans. percentage uh, of Prices. the population in France that is Muslim is is uh, it's in the double digits now, isn't it? Uh, yes, I believe so. And uh, yeah. I mean that I mean that creates a huge amount of uh, social unrest, competition. I mean societies tend to succeed. You know, Aristotle said when he he called it the middling element. You know, you want mm-hmm. a lot of the middling element, not the extremes. Mm-hmm. So in, in economic terms, that would be kind of like saying you want a large middle class. And in cultural terms, you want you want to say people need to have something in common. Uh, mm-hmm. There has to be a, a, a real sense of the of the common good. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean we all have to have the same religion per se, this, that, or the other. But uh, somehow you've got to hold the country together. And that's going to be rooted, among other things, in a, a shared sense of heritage and history, and I think a commitment to building a, a common future. Uh, and I think one could make a, a pretty easy case that, uh, you know, Catholics in France, you know, tracing their lineage back to, to Charlemagne and beyond, um, certainly have a different heritage than the followers of, of the prophet. And I think that when uh, faithful Catholics look forward to the future in France, it's very likely to look different than uh, Muslims and living in France when, when they look at, at the future uh, in France. And yet it seems to be impolite to, to, to state these things. Has that been your experience? Yeah, Matt, absolutely. Um, there has to be. I mean, right now you could say that there are uh, two competing visions of Europe. One is, uh, you know, cosmopolitan, uh, secularist. Um, it's, it's about freedom, uh, liberation, openness, and uh, the other, and that's the vision kind of embodied in the current leadership of the European Union. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you have a Christian and historical vision, and, and that's why Benedict XVI wanted God to be mentioned in the prelude, Christianity to be mentioned in the prelude to the European Constitution. And of course that was uh, fought against, and as I recall, Poland was, uh, was denounced by the powers that be for, for daring to suggest that Christianity might be mentioned as relevant to the history of, of Europe, which is an astonishing thing uh, to me. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Matthew Schmidt, Senior Editor of First Things. Our topic is, What Do Young Catholics Want? And in the upcoming segment, we're going to talk about, Can We Reach Out Without Dumbing Down? Can we make the faith attractive without watering it down? You don't want to miss this conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Liturgy of the Hours is prayed three times a day on the Station of the Cross at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. It is the daily prayer of the Church, prayed throughout the world by priests, religious, and laity. For details about each hour and for more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. Our family is made up of every race. We are young and old, rich and poor, men and women, sinners and saints. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We establish orphanages and help the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing relief and comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other scholarly or religious institution. We developed the scientific method and laws of evidence. We founded the college system. We defend the dignity of all human life and uphold marriage and family. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible 
We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have consistently guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church, with over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith. Jesus laid the foundation for our faith when he said to Peter, the first pope, You are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. For over 2,000 years, we've had an unbroken line of shepherds guiding us with love and truth. If you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. Ours is one family, united in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We are Catholic. Welcome home. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKaig of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. The question we're addressing today is, what do young Catholics want? Our guest is Matthew Schmitz, Senior Editor of First Things. If you're just joining us, you should know that from the top of the hour, we talked about uh, an article that Matthew had published in First Things in March that will be available on our uh, resources list at the end of the program today. And it described how a a young priest in France was photographed with young people. The young priest was wearing a traditional cassock, and the diocese photoshopped it to make the uh, priest looked like he was wearing just a clerical shirt and blue jeans. We talked about the outcome of the Youth Synod recently concluded in Rome, and we observed that there seemed to be a, a disparity or disconnect be- between the religious, uh, tired and somewhat decadent culture of the West and the persecuted church in the Middle East and the growing church in the South, especially in Africa. In this segment, we're going to look at how we can reach out without dumbing down, how we can make uh, the the faith attractive to people without making it uh, more foolish or watered down. Uh, Matthew, during the commercial break, I received a, 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 a meme from a friend, and it reads this way. Baby boomers say, the church needs to listen to the young people. And young people say, we want tradition, chant, orthodox preaching, and sound doctrine. And the boomers reply, you hear that? They want guitar masses. How do we step outside of of that not listening dynamic? Right. Well, it's, um, you know, I'd say that, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, as, as you touched on earlier, you know, a lot of the people who brought about the guitar masses, they had a very uh, solid formation, um, and they could, so they could kind of go out uh, confident that they're, uh, they had a secure home to return to. Um, what I found, you know, I was received into the church when I was in college, and, uh, had a good, you know, very good conscientious instruction. But, you know, one thing I observed was that the instruction tended to focus on um, certain kind of abstract moral and ethical questions, say the the church's stance on uh, abortion, on the death penalty, on the environment. And uh, those are important things. Mm-hmm. But but I one thing that I, I no one no one told me that I was supposed to abstain for food from food for a period before receiving communion. So I remember that I've been right. Catholic for for about a year or two and I asked a friend, you know, hey, will you let's let's get a bite and then go to mass and he said, What are you what are you talking about? We only have half an hour. <laughs> we can't go get a we can't go get a burger and then go to mass. And uh, that's when I realized that one was supposed to abstain before communion because no one had told me that kind of practical thing. So, you know, I, I think a good question, you know, people talk about the rote memorization that was done in, you know, the Baltimore Catechism and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You always have to go beyond that, right? That's not, sure. the faith is not just about regurgitating answers or, or having a, a whole bunch of things down pat. Um, but uh, you you need to give people those rudiments, and I would say that that point could be more more broadly applied. You have to 
give them a sense of uh, you know what the Christian feasts are, um, right. and, and l- allow them to experience that. And, th- and th- really, that's more important than say an open air mass or a, uh, a service trip or, or something like that. Those, though those things, uh, I mean, you know, certainly you know all, all the works of charity and gathering together as young people, uh, they are very important as well. Well, I, I think there has to be some movement uh, in the direction of, of kind of a, a back to the basics that the powers that be seem to be reluctant. Uh, let me tell you a story. A, a friend of mine, faithful priest, who's a member of a certain religious community with which I have some familiarity, uh, was assigned to a very prominent self-identified Catholic college, and he asked the folks at campus ministry, hey, I want you to put me on the roster for scheduled confessions. He says, oh, no, no, we don't have scheduled confessions here. Well, why not? And he said, well, we don't want people to get scruples. And he said, are you kidding me? I would love to have uh, an encounter of scruples. That would be so astonishingly refreshing. It would be invigorating to encounter a set of scruples rather than the the bacchanalia that was taking place in the dorms uh, constantly. Uh, and I also think that we, we need to retrieve the, the very best of what the church has to offer in, in terms of beauty uh, as well. I mean, people may may argue and, and, and disagree about finer points of theology, but you know, who can deny that Chartres is, is beautiful? Who can deny that Notre Dame is beautiful, that Palestrina is beautiful? And, and one of the uh, great evangelizers uh, in terms of using beauty as, as, a, as a, a wedge is Bishop Robert Barron. Now, some folks think that, that Bishop Robert Barron is, is the great new hope for young people, and some people are hesitant about him and see him as the Catholic version of, of Jordan Peterson. What's your take on Bishop Aaron? <laughs> the Catholic version of Jordan Peterson. Well, you know, I, th- I think Jordan Peterson has done a fair bit to help people. But the thing, you know, Peterson, he, I think Peterson, like a lot of his followers, he he's searching for something real, but he doesn't quite know where to find it. The thing about Bishop Aaron right. is he knows he knows where to find it, and he he directs people to to the truth. Um, he's you know w- one of the uh, few bishops we have in America, uh, and really one of the few bishops in the world in his generation who has a, a very real and serious theological education, which he mm-hmm. received at, uh, in Belgium before the uh, kind of Catholic faculty there uh, was you know, effectively shut down, right. and uh, priests, American priests, started getting educated in Rome uh, more exclusively. And so, you know, Barron is a, is a really, really wonderful resource uh, for people. Um, a, the wife of a dear friend of mine was really brought into the church through uh, Barron's videos, and uh, I'm sure there are just countless, countless stories like that. So uh, the thing about uh, Bishop Barron is that he's he's not a guru. He's 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 never gone out and said, "Hey, follow me." Mm-hmm. <laughs> He said, "He said, follow Jesus, and uh, that's that's what that's exactly what we need." Well, you you want to be very wary of, of any cleric who, who sets up his his own brand, uh, so to speak. I'm also thinking too of the motto of the the great Jesuit missionaries who said, "You know, enter through their door, but lead them through yours." So, so the Jesuit missionaries, you know, Francis Xavier as the, as the exemplar. Was you know he he learned the language he knew how to dress in the culture and conduct himself in the culture and then he pointed people to Christ. M- my perception is, is that oftentimes well-intentioned folks who want to work with young people enter through their door through social media, popular music, etc., and then just stay there, uh, or at most try to have. Uh, a tepid ecclesial version of what the world has to offer, and I say, you know, you can't outworld the the world for worldliness. You know, n- no praise and worship uh, service is ever going to outdo the light show at a Beyonce concert, and and we we have to admit that. Uh, why do you think there there's a, seems to be a failure of, of nerve to offer tr- tradition to young people? It's a it's a great question. I think that. Uh you know, tradition makes uh, claims on us. It, it asks us to uh, submit, but uh, in, you know, it probably one of the things going on is that in, in the 20th century, in the wake of World War II, um, it's kind of intensified in the 60s. There was a notion that any reference to tradition, authority, the past, 
was necessarily bad, and we needed to focus on uh, now and the future, on um, uh, kind of everything being horizontal, everything open, everything democratic, and uh, that, that was taken too far. Um, and uh, now we're probably going to have a, re a rebalancing against that. Um, you know, the you know throughout the church's history, you see that. Um, you know, council comes, there's a period of controversy after it, but over time things settle down and the council kind of fades into memory. So it's, mm -hmm. at some point, uh, even the memory of Vatican II will fade. Uh, it won't be, you know, abolished or struck from the books, but the memory of it will fade. Um, so a, if a young priest who's, say, getting ordained this year, who's 30 or so, he would be... Uh, Vatican II would be as far from him, say, as Vatican I was for the uh, fathers of Vatican II. So we're we're getting to the point where some of these young priests, you know, they are. Um, I, I don't think we'll have Vatican III so soon. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Would not, would not would not be a good thing. But right. we are we are getting uh, we're getting past the council a little bit. So you'll probably see debates about the precise meaning of the council. Uh, how to interpret it, how to implement it, uh, fading a bit, because it won't have been a real lived experience for, uh, for say, young clergy, young Catholics. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't imagine anyone under 40 uh, talking about the spirit of Vatican II, uh, for example. Uh, you know, but, you know, that, and that phrase, spirit of Vatican II, was as, as, as elastic as, as the new evangelization. You know, why do we need new hymnals? Well, the new evangelization, you know, why do we need to have uh, more bingo than ever before? Well, it's, it's the new evangelization. Uh, I think we have to be, be cautious uh, about the, those really plastic uh, phrases that can be reshaped uh, to mean anything uh, that, that we want them uh, to mean. Uh, there are some well, folks who, who say... That that uh, you know, if the generation doesn't want to hand on tradition, it's not necessarily because of you know bad memories of you know ghetto Catholicism or so-called fortress Catholicism, but there's a lack of faith in the tradition itself. You know, that the old Broadway song said, you know, you got to have a gimmick, and if you don't believe in your product, then then you need uh, a gimmick. Do do you think it's an overinterpretation to say that the people who are reluctant to hand on the tradition have lost faith in the tradition? No, no, uh, not not at all. I mean, the why why would we want to talk about the spirit of Vatican II when we can talk about uh, you know the Holy Ghost? And that's why all these um, say being against uh, Catholic tradition. Or uh, it's it's so odd to to have that stance. Or when I if someone says you know I support you know I'm I love the spirit of Vatican II. You're oppose you're doing two things there. You're one you're opposing the spirit uh, to the letter, um, which is could be a very dangerous thing to do because you're kind of downgrading mm -hmm. what it actually says. Mm -hmm. And then you're also opposing Vatican II itself, probably to, to the tradition of the whole Church, as if it's. Right. Uh, you know, altogether distinct. Instead of, instead of a, you know, some some form of the hermeneutic of continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there there is a kind of an apparent crisis of faith, and it's um, it's disturbing, you know, to to hear people uh, say things that uh, sound sophisticated, but that are are worrying. So if someone says, you know, well, the devil isn't a real person, or 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 hell doesn't exist. I mean, you can say that they can claim that all they're doing is trying to reject, say, simple or vulgar misconceptions about what the devil or hell is really like. But it, it used to be the case that the church was very eager to reach simple and vulgar people. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it, it actually, uh, I mean, you would have to describe the apostles um uh, you would have to number the the apostles among the simple and vulgar. So if we, say, use literal terms to describe uh, Satan or to describe uh, eternal damnation, that's that's an important way of reaching people who only talk or think in those ways and aren't, uh, aren't really inclined to enter into these academic seminar-type debates about all this. So I'm, I, I do think there's not only a lack of faith, but maybe a contempt for uh, less educated Catholics. 
And, and I, I think too that、uh, if we take history seriously, we have to take tradition seriously. And we're not naive about there was ever a good old days. There hasn't been a good old days since since the Garden of Eden.、Uh, but there is a heritage that we are sworn to hand on. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Matthew Schmidt, senior editor of First Things, addressing the question: What do young Catholics want? And we plan to end on a hopeful note, providing you with resources and allies and reasons for hope. As we evangelize the rising generation, stay with us. We'll be right back. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9:30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you'll join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9:30 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Station of the Cross. Can a moral relativist object to God's goodness based on the problem of evil? The answer is no, at least when it comes to moral evil, and here's the reason. You see, moral relativism states no moral truths exist independently of the individual. That's to say, what is right and wrong is relative to what the individual determines. Now, how can a relativist deviation from his own moral standard be considered morally evil when there's nothing to oblige him to follow his moral standard? The answer is it can't. But if no moral evil can exist within the mental framework of moral relativism, well, then obviously a relativist complaint about the problem of moral evil is useless. So the relativist either has to give up the complaint about the problem of moral evil to keep relativism, or give up relativism to keep the complaint about the problem of moral evil. The relativist can't have both. I'm Carlo Brusard with a ready reason for Catholic answers. Catholic.com. Tune in weekdays from six to seven a.m. Eastern for sermons for everyday living. There's no better way to start your day than with spiritual formation from inspiring priests as they preach the gospel in the midst of your busy life. For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. That's Sermons for Everyday Living weekdays six to seven a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Shortly after today's show, visit our page for the Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. Here you'll find a link to Father McTague's recommended reading list and a link for downloading the program so that you can share it with your family and friends. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is this: What do young people want? Our guest is Matthew Schmitz, senior editor of First Things Magazine. Since the top of the hour, we've been addressing what do young people want. And we're discovering what young people want is a little bit different from what the baby boomer generation says they should want.、Uh, the young people generally want more access to authentic Catholic tradition. We've been talking about why that is and why that makes some of the grown-ups unhappy. In this segment, we're going to talk about. Uh, resources and allies necessary for proper evangelization of Catholic youth. Matthew, suppose you have a, a young person, 20 years old, 22 years old, and he knows that something isn't quite right, he, and he knows that the pablum he is being fed by、uh, Father Cheerful down at St. Typical's isn't enough for him、uh, anymore.、Uh, where should he turn to next? Well, there, there are. I'd say the first people,、uh, first place most people turn today is to the internet, and they you know, Google things and they start reading,、um, you know, about、uh, Catholicism, and that that's the way a lot of people are able to dig more deeply into the Catholic tradition,、uh, which is which is、uh, 
very helpful, and there are a lot, a lot of resources there. Though ultimately, what you're going to want to do is uh, try to find a, you know, a solid, a solid community. Um, I, w- you know, I would say some people are are lucky to have you know more um, more orthodox and uh, liturgically solid parishes. Um, sometimes they may offer the Latin Mass, uh, or you know, may offer the uh, Novus Ordo, but in a, in a more reverent way. And I'd say you know, that would be the best thing for people to seek out. I would say it's not wrong. It's not wrong to want beauty. Um, right. If if a if a mass is not nourishing your soul, don't be so proud as to think that you can get by without <laughs> without beauty. If that's what uh, your soul is crying out for, so you know I think people should should seek that out and. Um, you know, get involved in their in their parishes and see what they can do in terms of. Uh, well, I I, I want to add that if we uh, if we tolerate a diet of of spiro- spiritual malnutrition, our spiritual immune system is going to be compromised, and we're either going to uh, walk in the direction of sin or walk in the direction of error. So it's a matter of urgency to get the best that the that the church has to offer. I know there's there's and at least in larger dioceses there's uh branches of a group called Ju- Juventuntum, which is Latin for youth, and it's to help teach people about the venerable rights of the church, people who uh who are young and introduce them to the great heritage of beauty and music and art uh, and sanctity. Uh, there's also a very good website called New Liturgical Movement, and there's uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski who writes there uh, often. So I, I would recommend them as well. Uh, do you have any books you'd recommend to to young people who who are really uh, seeking for richer Catholic fare? Uh, absolutely, I would. Uh, you recommend uh, from contemporary writers. Um, Martin Mosebach's book, The Heresy of Formlessness, which is a very eloquent um, defense of, of the riches and beauties of Catholic tradition. Uh, you know, and beyond that, I would just you know, refer people to, you know, really, it's very, it's very basic, but if you, if you pick up uh, the works of uh, John Henry Newman, or you know, mm-hmm. pick up Augustine's Confessions, uh, or uh, The City of God, Say you know anything for anything from the uh, from the Church Fathers, uh, Flannery O'Connor, great Catholic writer. She would just read a little uh, question from the Summa each night, and that's probably not right for everyone. But uh, you know, e- even that might not be uh, such a bad idea. So, but I would say if you if people who are specifically interested in these questions of liturgy and tradition, I would go first to Martin Mosebach's book, The Heresy of Formlessness. And, and then Peter Kwasniewski has a book called Resurgent in the Midst of Crisis, and then uh, Noble Beauty, Transcendent Holiness. And I'm, I'm almost done with his latest book, Tradition and Sanity. And I, and I think they they can stir really thoughtful conversation, and they can they can stir uh, prayer uh, a, as well. Are the religious communities that are you familiar with that, that are that are doing good work with young people? Well, the. Uh, East Coast Dominicans uh, are doing a very uh, good job. The Saint Joseph Province are doing a very good job of engaging uh, young people intellectually. Their their focus is not on, uh, say, tradition and liturgy, but they they're hosting um, good academic programs, doing what I would call sort of Thomistic resource mont, a recovery of uh, this Thomistic tradition that has long been so important to the church. So I'd encourage people to look into uh, the Dominicans. Uh, you know, I they're based in the Dominican House things. of Studies in Washington D.C., right. aren't they? Okay, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, of course, we have um, you know many good Jesuits. You know, there's a uh, your show, Father McTagg, and uh, you know, other Jesuits. You know, my my friend, uh, Father Paul Mankowski. Oh yes. Um, who's a uh, you know who's a brilliant writer. So uh, you know, there are, there are just a lot of resources. It's different. It's different everywhere. But I'd say if you see someone at if you go to a mass. Um, your area, you can you know, just talk to people, uh, uh, t- take another Catholic out to coffee, and they can probably give you a good local suggestion. Right, and in terms of good Jesuit writers, uh, Father James Shaw, S-C-H-A-L-L, who is unbelievably productive. I don't think he's slept in the last 70 years. He's written so much, and it's all 
of uh, of really stellar quality. Uh, and I also think there, there's no substitute for uh, for good Catholic fellowship. I mean, I would recommend to young people, you know, get a group of friends together and get together on Thursday nights and just review the scriptures for the upcoming Sunday Mass and and talk about them and go to Mass together and and go outside after have some coffee and, and do a uh, a homiletic post mortem, and um, and just review what God is is doing in your life. What about for the people who have responsibility for for forming young Catholics? What advice would you give them? I would tell them to uh, you know offer offer real uh, real food to the people. Uh, you know, young people like to be challenged, like to be taken seriously, and. Uh, you know, the, the more that you do that, I would say, the better. So give them, uh, you know, real liturgy. Give them, uh, you know, real instruction in the faith, and you know, find find you know a, a priest or a lay theologian who knows his stuff and can, uh, you know, really uh, take him to the races. Okay. Uh, are there any pieces of of art or music that you would recommend? Oh boy! <laughs> well, uh, I. I love um I think you know the one piece of music not not uh written by a Catholic of course but a uh, box B minor mass is one thing that mm. mm-hmm. but when I was still a Protestant that drew me t- uh to the church so there I mean there's so many wonderful uh wonderful settings of the mass I'd say it's important to um one, one thing you know you want to live kind of live a life of of prayer and one that there are many ways to do this, um, you know, many prayers one can do every day. Um, there's the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a very old form of prayer that a lot of lay people would do uh, because it's not too time consuming. And maybe doing a, you know, kind of morning prayers or vespers from that would be a good way to engage. And I want to make a plug for one of my favorite Catholic painters, Caravaggio. Uh, just go online, look for everything he's painted, and, and you could have. Uh, a retreat based on that alone. Matthew Schmidt, Senior Editor of First Things, thank you for being on The Catholic Current. I hope we can have you on again soon. Thanks for having, having me, Father. I'm Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus. Listen to us on The Catholic Current Monday through Friday, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may God, our Lord, protect you from all harm and from every evil until you reach the happiness of heaven. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.